Dr. Oviedo will be speaking about um, mild stimulation and natural stimulation IVF protocols. This is my title, and you actually heard everything about stimulation, and I'm sure you all know that it's a mite. And uh, what I will try to do now is only to put some order into the issue of mild and uh, natural cycle IVF. Nothing to disclose. So you're familiar with these slides, control of hyperstimulation, the key factor for the success of IVF, aiming to recruit many oocytes, and we are speaking about how many. I've already showed that we need 15 oocytes, 10 cleaved embryo, or five uh, uh, blastocysts in order to yield a high probability of live births. And here is a study that was shown several times in this uh, Congress from the Bristol group showing that actually when you're looking at cumulative pregnancy rate, fresh and frozen, so the much, the better. If you have more oocytes, you will have a higher cumulative life birth rate. So I can stop now the presentation because actually if you want more oocytes, you need control of hyperstimulation and all the mild, soft, and the natural cycle are actually is, is not are not providing this yield or goal. Let's say what's what's actually what is mild or natural cycle or stimulation. So the ISMAR, the International Society of Mild Approach to Assisted Reproduction, has proposed this terminology in 2007. And as you can see, they defined a natural cycle as a cycle without medication, aiming, aiming to yield one single oocyte. Mild IVF is defined as the use of up to 150 units of gonadotropin a day using the antagonist protocol and yielding two to seven oocytes. And conventional, you can use whatever you want, but you have to yield eight or more oocytes. So actually, if I'm embarking a patient on a mild stimulation, let's say a young PCOS patient that are coming to an IVF cycle because his husband is a, which actually virtual azospera need ICSI, and I will offer a 75 units of FSH on an antagonist protocol that actually, that's what is required for the mild stimulation. So I'm embarking on the mild stimulation protocol, and at the end of the day, after aspiration, I realize that I yield 15 oocytes. So is she in the mild category or she is in the conventional category? They actually defined the stimulation, and then you categorize the patient according to the outcome. So it's a, but there is a little problem with this definition. So that's about the definition. Now, when you're looking at mild stimulation, you compare them to uh, the conventional stimulation, so there is a lot of advantage and disadvantage between these two uh, protocols. And I think that the, there are three main things that we have to, to deal with. One of them is where the cumulative pregnancy rate per started cycle, fresh and frozen, is different between the mild and the conventional. What about oocyte quality? And Dr. Weghofer already showed you that actually all the, the one who claim that with mild stimulation you get more aeroploid oocytes, it is not. So I will show some of the study and highlight something that was not shown before. And the issue of cost. We are using mild stimulation, we are using less gonadotropin, so probably it's cheaper, and we will see also if it's, it's true. So let's see what's with regard to pregnancy rate and cumulative pregnancy rate. So this is a study, a, non, a randomized non-inferiority -inferior, trial, comparing mild stimulation to the standard stimulation. You can see that with the mild stimulation, we are using less gonadotropin. The duration of treatment is, is lower, but cancellation rate is higher. The number of oocytes uh, uh, retrieved are low, uh, is lower. Also, the number of embryos. 
there is a bit higher uh, uh, incidence of uh, OHSS. And at the end of the day, what is important that pregnancy rate per cycle and life rate per cycle are actually twice as high in the conventional compared to the mild stimulation. So pregnancy rate, life birth rate is higher in the conventional compared to the mild stimulation. Here is another meta-analysis looking at the mild stimulation protocol. You can see that they could include only three studies. And when you look at, the stu at, at these studies and you look at the distribution of the number of retrieved oocytes, you can see that actually this is the mild stimulation and this is a patient undergoing the conventional stimulation. So you can see that many of the patients that were embarked on the conventional stimulation ended with the mild stimulation, with, with less than eight oocytes, and many of the patients that were embarked on the mild stimulation ended as conventional stimulation with more, eight, more than eight oocytes. When we are looking at implantation rates, so the, the best or the optimal implantation rate in those undergoing the mild stimulation was when they had five oocytes, and with the conventional, when they had the yield 10 oocytes. And when we are looking at the pregnancy rate in, with these two protocols, so pregnancy rate was significantly, actually twice as high in those undergoing the conventional compared to the mild stimulation. So it's actually clear that the pregnancy rate is higher in those using the conventional compared to the mild. And now, this is the study of Barat that you have already uh, saw in Dr. Weghofer's uh, presentation that started all this issue of uh, mild stimulation and the association of the decreased aeroploid uh, uh, prevalence, embryo prevalence. So if you are looking at this study, so they, the mild stimulation was the antagonist protocol and the uh, conventional stimulation was the, the uh, long agonist protocol. So uh, 44 patients in the mild stimulation yielded 459 oocytes. So if you divide 450 to 44, meaning that the mean oocyte retrieved is, it was about 10 oocytes per patient. So 10 oocytes per patient, by the ISMAR definition, are no more mild stimulation. They are actually comparing the PLOM protocol with the uh, antagonist protocol. So an another thing that you can see that when they made this fish analysis on day three embryo, and we know what the accuracy of this uh, uh, test, when they did it on one cell, so there was no difference in aeroploid embryo. And when you're looking at the prevalence of aeroploid embryo, it was 30%. It is a very low prevalence because in all the other studies that you saw, it's supposed to be about 60%. Now, when they made this analysis with two cells, so you can see that the normal uh, aeroploid embryo, were, uh, the prevalence were higher in the mild stimulation, and this is why the conclusion of this study was that the mild stimulation offered a higher prevalence of uh, aeroploid embryo. But see that the abnormal abnormal is the same, and the abnormal is the same, and actually, when you're looking at normal and normal a mosaic, so the, incident, the prevalence is actually the same. And we know what mean when we are looking, what, what mean when we get the result of normal and mosaic. Probably most of them are normal embryos. As we already shown recently, in, also in this Congress, in Greco studies, that when they transfer this mosaic embryo, six patients out of the 18 uh, delivered the aeroploid newborn. I want to get to the other study that you have already uh, saw in Dr. Weghofer's uh, uh, presentation, but only see that when we are speaking about the aneuploid prevalence is 30%, meaning that 60% should be aeroploid, which is twice as high as the Barat study. So actually, there is no difference in the prevalence of aeroploidy between the mild and the conventional stimulation. Now, what about natural cycle IVF? So this is a Cochrane review, sick randomized control study consisting for about 800 patients. And in this Cochrane review, you can see that there is actually no difference in pregnancy rate or life birth rate when you are comparing the fresh cycle of mild and 
conventional stimulation. But when you are looking at this Cochrane, again, zoom in, meta-analysis, you can see that there is one study that include or treated more than 300 patients, and all the other studies are 10 patients, 20 patients. So let's have a look at the, the, at the study that included more than 300 patients. So this is the study. They randomized three, uh, three arms, three group of patients. Those who underwent IU, COH IUI 6 cycle, modified natural cycle IVF 6 cycle, and compared them to the to three cycles of IVF with, sing, with single embryo transfer. And we're looking to this study, to this study you can see, and they look at cumulative pregnancy rate after a year. So you can see that the modified natural with six cycles of a natural cycle, this is the pregnancy rate of the cumulative after one year, mm -hmm. and this is of the convention, uh, of the single IVF conventional with a the, with the set, Pregnancy rate after a year was 20% higher using the conventional compared to the mild stimulation. And in order to achieve these figure, figures, you need half the numbers of cycle using the conventional, meaning that for 20% less pregnancy rate after cumulative after a year, they had to undergo twice as much cycles using the modified natural. A review of the literature from Pel Pelnik, 20 studies, total of 1,800 cycles. You can see that you will reach the embryo transfer stage when you're using the natural cycle, only 50% of the cycles, meaning 100 patients are starting the natural cycle. Only 15 will, will uh, get to the transfer, embryo transfer day. And pregnancy rate was between 7 to 50 percent, depending if it was per cycle or per transfer. Another study by Pelnik, they looked at the cumulative pregnancy rate after maximum of nine cycles. You can see the pregnancy rate per cycle is about 7 to 10 percent using the natural cycle. And after nine cycles, only 40 percent of the patient actually conceived. And you can see also the huge dropout using the natural cycle. And here is a, what I called a, a, our a everyday practice study. And this is a study that looked on the life birth rate and perinatal outcome from the IFA uh, registry, 20 years of the IFA registry, in, consisting of about 600 uh, stimulated cycle, 600. 100,000 simulated cycle and 6,000 unstimulated cycle. But when you are looking at the stimulation variables, you can see there are much more oocyte and embryos following the stimulated cycle. And pregnancy rate was 4%, or life birth rate was 4% following the unstimulated cycle, and 22% following the conventional cycle. So it's obvious and clear that using a conventional IVF yield a much better, fresh, cumulative life birth rate compared to the, the mite stimulation. What about the cost? So this is another study that looking at the cost. The cost per cycle and the cost per live birth. So they compared a modified natural cycle to conventional cycle with set and with double transfer. So as you can see, if you're looking at First of all, if, before going to the cost, if you're looking at the ongoing pregnancy rate, so it's about two or three times higher using the conventional compared to, to, to the natural cycle. If you're looking at live birth rate, so it's four or five times higher using the conventional cycle. And if you're speaking about the cost, so it's obvious and expected that the cost of a natural cycle will be lower than the conventional because we are using less conalotropin, less of everything, but if we are looking at the cost per patient or per life birth rate, you can see that the cost is actually significantly higher using uh, the minimal or natural cycle. So to summarize, if you're speaking about cumulative uh, pregnancy at per starter cycle, it is better using the conventional. All side quality is probably the same, and the cost is even lower per a life birth, a life birth using the conventional. Thank you.